Good morning, Mikey. Can you hear us? Yeah, good morning. I just didn't hear any of that uh, delicious music that we have every morning. But uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Monday morning webinar. We appreciate everybody joining us today. And uh, as we get a rocking and rolling, a little sneak peek at what we've got uh, coming up today. All right. So, uh, of course, we had, I don't know, Todd, we've got numbers today, buddy? Yes, sir. All right, awesome. We've got Matt Baker with the Bookspan Baker team. Uh, Todd and I are going to talk about focusing on listings as the market is shifting. And then we've got our own Mindy Thompson is going to share secrets from her coaching clients. So uh, a lot, uh, lot going on today. But uh, as we get going, we're going to jump into some of the announcements. But as always, if you've got any comments or questions, please feel free to email us at webinar at westusa.com. All right, Nick, let's get rocking and rolling into some announcements. Guess you're doing it. All right, React. Uh, so exciting to have React back. If you have not attended React uh, and if you've joined West USA in the past couple of years and you have not gone through some of our uh, technology training, highly encourage you to do it. We're going to go through some things. Uh, we're going to talk about it today about the iFound Agent website. So you're going to want to get signed up for it. Uh, if you don't have a mobile app, uh, you need to get one of the mobile apps. We'll also take you through Transaction Desk and some of our uh, direct marketing uh, techniques. So as always, all of our events can be found on the West USA calendar. So get signed up for React. In addition to this week with React going on, our own Dwayne Faust in person going to be at the Scottsdale office for their office meeting. So that's coming up this Wednesday from 10 to 11. So uh, make sure that uh, not only do you show up, but uh, heckle him. Also, uh, office meetings in continuation, our Awatuki office meeting is going to be featuring uh, Dean Becker and Nick Wiedekamp. Uh, I, I felt like I saw this, this picture and I didn't know whether this was like a uh, St. Patrick's Day thing. Um, they look like a couple shamrock elves here. But anyway, so we appreciate uh, uh, those guys showing up. So that's going to be uh, coming up for this Wednesday at the Awatuki office meeting. Thursday. A lot of great stuff. This Thursday, yes. Thank you. And lunch will be provided. So that's more importantly, green eggs and ham. All right. Also, uh, this Wednesday, Todd's got his next CE class uh, from 9 to 12. If you're looking for three hours of commissioner standards, get signed up. And these classes are very, very convenient for you. They are all virtual. So definitely get signed up if you need some CE classes coming up this Wednesday. All right. And then Keith's got a class that's coming up this Wednesday from 1 to 2, another virtual class. Uh, how to edit videos with Canva. We talk a lot about Canva and doing a lot of things like uh, creating creating memes and flyers and PowerPoint presentations, but Keith Flynn is going to take you through the process of actually edit, editing videos in Canva. And if you've ever been and attended any of Keith's classes, you know his emphasis is on videos and, and we need to be focusing on videos. All right, happy hour. This uh, Thursday for our Arrowhead office, your opportunity to meet your new, new manager, Anna Beltran. So this is gonna be great. So for those of you in Arrowhead, or any office uh, and you're part of West USA, definitely feel free. Well, I'd say uh, any agent anywhere from any brokerage, more than welcome to show up to our happy hours. Uh, Nick is buying the drinks and the first round of appetizers. So that's coming up. Okay, he just I'll went go right faster, through that. Mikey, I can go faster. <laughs> All right. And then as always, uh, Bob Stevens every Monday afternoon for a little don't do that. All right, we're going to bring in Todd Menard. Todd, uh, what is going on in the marketplace? Well, good morning, Mike, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Today, we're going to go over the market statistics for the greater Phoenix metro area and suburbs for the week ending June 6th and the week prior. Plus, we're also going to talk about May, what happened in May. So let's get right into the numbers here. Uh, across the board, we have 28 days closed on market this past week, a 1.64. Look at that, over a month and a half month supply, 6.64. 61.12 absorption rate. Our average list price is at 788,000. Our average sale price at 634,000. And our average list price to sale price retention at 
100.75. Uh, take a look at inventory. This is not a mistake. This is residential single family properties. You're looking at 11 or residential, yep, 11,329 in inventory. That's an increase of 16.7%. Pending is down 10.3%, as we'll talk about that. 4,159 closed units, a little too early in the month to really have a conversation there. New listings, we took 2,500. There's my magic number again, over 25. Uh, days on market at 58.4%. Days on market closed briskly still at 28 uh, days on market. So uh, this is really, this is kind of a unique thing right here. I mean, look at what has just taken place over here under 500,000. We're now at 44.79% uh, of the entire inventory under $500,000. That's, uh, you know, it's it, it's ebbing away from us. And, and what's happening is we're increasing those numbers right here. This used to be 20%, the number above it over in the 500,000 and under it used to be 73% of the entire inventory. This is a permanent shift, pretty much so. Uh, that $500 to $900,000 price range picking up the difference at 41%. Our million dollar and up market still hovering right about 14%, and that's right in line with what the numbers have always been historically for decades. Taking a look across the board up here, this is real important. We're going to look right in the very, very center column. Uh, it's, it's identified as 2019 SW or as in Goldenrod. That's the same week in 2019, a pre-COVID year. Then the next number to the left is 2021 SW, same week in 2021. And then to the left of that, we have two columns, June 6th and May 23rd, reflecting week over week uh, what's taken place, it's the 23rd, because of course, last week we didn't have some stats. So new listings, we took 2,584, we took 2,541, uh, 2,641 the week before. Um, so these are some really strong numbers. Look at 2019, the middle row, 1,888 listings we took in the middle of one of the best years we've ever had, uh, 2,121, and then in 2,500 listings right now, this is, a, this is exactly what the doctor ordered. When you're over 2,500 listings, you're adding to the active inventory. And here it is. Last week, two weeks ago, we were at 9,704 listings, active listings. Uh, we're now at 11,329. That's a 15% increase. Slide drives to the right. Last year, we only had 6,100 uh, properties available to us. We have almost twice that now. Uh, the year before that, in uh, 20, two years before that in 2019, uh, again, that's uh, actually right there's uh, a little bit of a typo, 16,700. So it was, a, it was a little off that point. But if you're looking back to the left, you're looking under the first this week's columns, you're looking at 900 and uh, I'm having a little difficulty seeing it right now, but it looks like uh, 921 uh, in coming soon listings, 9423 in single family detached, 1189 in new home construction. Certainly that has helped 11,305 non-distressed properties. That's up 16.4% uh, pending. So why, when you take 2,500 new listings and you don't have that many people in the marketplace? So I, I am, I'm imagining at this particular moment from the realtors that I've talked to, as well as just the numbers themselves, um, everybody's realizing there's fewer people in the marketplace right now. I mean, significantly fewer. Um, we're going to hear from Matt in, in, in the Booksman Baker uh, fairway difference in, in just a little bit. I, I don't know if, if the if the mortgage apps are up or not, but I, I had imagined he's going to tell us it's up or down. But 4,159 are all the, that's the number of properties that are in escrow right now, a meeting of the sellers and the buyer's minds. Last week, we were at 4,638, but we were at 5,500. Now, the, the, thing here is that the higher number here is not necessarily a green light. Um, you know, some, and, a, and a much too low number is not a good sign. That means we're scaring people out of the market, that buyer's remorse is taking effect and people just aren't even engaging. But it's not that. We're sitting here, we've got you know, more people putting properties on their on the market right now, 2,584, more people putting properties on the market right now than they d have ever done. We've never had over 2,600, 25, 2,600 in a very, 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 let's keep saying, very long time. Um, so this is a very, very good sign. And then of course, when you have fewer people uh, under contract, that means that we use this number that 4,159 is there's fewer people in the marketplace. 
So now we have a 1.6 month supply uh, up from 1.2, uh, double what we had for a month, almost three times what we had for a month supply uh, last year. Looking at average sale price of 788, that was a little bit of a cooling off this past week from 806 the week before. Uh, and again, remember this is all the properties that, the properties that have just been added to the marketplace, plus the properties that are there now. What is the average? And we're sitting at 788. Average sale price is sitting at 400, uh, 633,000. 634 and again that is falling within that four to eight percent we were talking about at the beginning of the year we were uh, anticipating an eight percent appreciation in, the, in Arizona right now remember this isn't appreciation but this kind of gives you an, an idea on what's selling at what price and if it continues to do that which is what we're anticipating we're not going to see uh, you know really any slowdown from that perspective that's a, again a very good sign and and it's just saying that the lid is not off the jar you know these properties are uh, even though they're higher priced uh, we don't anticipate seeing them be there being any reduction in pricing. Um, so this is just going to remain constant. List price, sale price retention down again, down to 100.75. Again, a nice number below that of last year. But again, we are trying to get under 100% from that number. So moving right along. Looking and comparing May of 2022 to April of 2022 and May of 2022 to May of 2021, we're looking here at these numbers. We're seeing we had 12,241 new properties added to inventory this past week, uh, this past month, in comparison to 10,500 a year ago. So again, there's that 2,000 we're adding. Right, really, it says it right there to to our inventory. Uh, looking at the uh, actual inventory itself, 11,349 11, versus 7,700 last year. Uh, slide rise just a little bit further. We only had 8,800 at the end of last month, the last of April. Uh, we only had 8,800. So again, that's you see the numbers to the left in green. That's a 40% increase. Uh, that, that's huge. Um, taking a look at people in the marketplace, pending units, 6,132 average pending units at any one time throughout the month. 9,900, which is what it was in 2021. So again, we're 3,000 fewer people in the marketplace, which is help was helping us add to that inventory base because if you're not consuming it that absorption you're not eating it up um, then it's going to continue to increase and this is a very good sign we finished the month with 8759 closed units in comparison to 9600 the year before so we're not exceeding the closings anymore uh, and we haven't been really since about August of last year we've been uh, down anywhere from three to ten percent uh, this again stays right within that that ballpark there very comfortable it's not a crisis for you guys as as you unit count goes down and sale prices in continue to increase your compensation if that's what you're worried about doesn't change uh, if you're a unit person that you're interested in just the numbers of closings then that's a different story Taking a look at the uh, phantom short <laughs> phantom uh, default inventory, uh, there isn't any. Uh, again, uh, very very small, less than 0.3 percent of less than 0.3 of one percent uh, is really uh, makes it non-existent. Uh, list the the month supply was at 1.3, 0.8. So we've got again almost twice the month supply uh, because we're slowing down. Month supply is how many people are consuming it versus how much inventory is there and how long can we survive without adding any inventory that's what those numbers mean and so basically we're in really good shape from that perspective uh every again if people are worried about you know there being uh, well here's the one thing we should know right now we need to get off of recommending to people that they pay more than the comp value right now because the market has stalled this was great a year ago in 2020 2021 you could justify you know potentially because of californians not because the market was demanding more money you and i as realtors helped push that, um, helped educate people that they needed to pay above. But if it had been organic, I don't think there would have been that much of an increase uh, as, as much. Anyway, in this particular section uh, portion, what I'm saying is that the sale prices are not going up as high as they were. We're 10% off the pressure that was here before. So if, you're if there's fewer people in the marketplace and there's more product on the market, that does mean we're sliding more up into a neutral, more neutral market. We're 
We're going to continue to see this trend all through the summer uh, and, and basically through into the new year. Now, one of the things that we're waiting for the numbers to come out is, is when we finished the second quarter and we move into July, one of the things we're going to have to look at is, are we in a recession? What's the definition of a recession? Two quarters in a row of, of contraction, of negative of numbers that were less as good as the prior month. Um, and so as a result, we could be. Uh, but again, we're not going to see discounts in prices. We're not going to see really slowing down greatly in any more than it's already slowing down as far as unit counts concerned. Look, talk to any of the economists that you're looking at out there. Um, you know, really, this is going to be a different type of recession if, in fact, we do end up going into one uh, at the end of this month. Taking a look at the days on market. Again, very, very stable, still pretty brisk when that right, ho right house comes on the market. Um, and then again, our list price to sell price retention, we ended last month at 101.8. Again, that was the same as the month prior. That shows, again, a little stability in the marketplace. Um, I got nothing really negative to say, but let me show you these last three pieces. Um, and this will recap where we're at so far year to date. Um, so looking at inventory 2022 to 2021 from January on the right to May on the left, what I want you to see is the difference in the two lines. The red line represents 20. 2021, the blue line represents 2022. As you can see in May, the inventory took off. Uh, we That's where you see that huge spread right there. But you compare that now to the pending, the people that are in the marketplace. Well, the red line represents 2021, the average number of pending units at any point in time. And the red line represents, excuse me, the blue line represents 2022. There's significantly almost, <laughs> and these lines are very, very similar, uh, parallel almost. If you look at the numbers to the left, there's almost 3,800 different uh, fewer people in the marketplace. That's almost, let's just call it what it is, 4,000 fewer people in the marketplace today than there was a year ago. So you, you got your inventory that's expanding. You've got your, uh, your pending, which is contracting. And now you look at your closings. And again, same representation, red is 2021, blue is 2022. So you can see May in the months, it goes from the beginning of the year at the right to the current to the left. So you're looking at May, look at the difference. The lines are separating. Uh, and again, we're, we still have some Fewer. We were pretty much on track with 2021 through the first three uh, first quarter, but now we're seeing it recede. What does it all mean? It basically all means we're an exceptionally stable real estate market. It means that there are more people putting their homes on the market today for sale than there has ever been in the recordation of armless look back. Um, and that there's fewer people in the marketplace than we were used to a year ago. So we need to start shifting our minds to the point where people don't have to pay balloon money, blue sky money to own a property today. Uh, it is shifting right now right underneath our, our, our fingers. So that's the numbers for the week. Um, these are the different places that you can uh, find us. And uh, if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to uh, give me a holler and uh, let me know. I'd be happy to help. I appreciate it, Todd. And we're going to bring in uh, Matt Baker into the conversation. What's going on with the uh, the mortgage rates, Matt? Did you magically make them drop back down to 2.75? I'm hoping Absolutely so. Absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> but let's talk about, you know, just some stability. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the fact that we've kind of gone sideways in rates for the better part of a month, three weeks or so has really helped. Uh, and, and part of it is, you know, you could say, well, is that you know, the Fed raising rates and, and well, part of it is built into that. And part of it is just trying to sort of at some point you have to sort of find a floor. Like, are we are we at that or not? You know, is a big question. But one of the things that Todd talked about was, you know, our mortgage applications down. And, you know, if you look at the national news and the NBA and all of those kind of statistics, yes, you know, mortgage, you know, most a purchase loan applicant because they track both purchase and refinance loan applications. The refinances are off you know, 80%. Yeah. Um, and then purchases are off maybe 10 or 12%. What I'm seeing in the market is, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm seeing the shift, but I'm seeing buyers that couldn't buy for the last 18 months because they were lower down payment. Uh, they were, you know, contingent. Now they're actually getting a look and they're getting a chance to win some of these, some of these deals. And so I think there is still demand there, um, just waiting to kind of, you know, settle out, right? It takes time before we, now you got to get them re pre approved and they got to go out and shop. And, you know, there's a timeline there. And I think from March to now, it's starting to rebuild because I've got people that are saying, hey, Matt, it's been a year. I'm ready to get back out there. You know, I, I feel like I've seen the inventory coming back on the market. I can, I, I can feel it uh, that now they maybe can win on some of those lower price deals. But let's talk about lending standards because this is another thing that, that just, 
floors me because, mm -hmm. you know, when you think about supply and demand and the real estate side, you know, think about it from the mortgage side, you know, it, and back in 2004 and 2005, there was this like, oh my gosh, there was a race to the bottom in terms of like, well, how low do you want to, how low do you want to lend on a credit score? Right. And so there's this data from the mortgage credit availability index that really talks about, well, since now mortgage, uh, you know, rates are higher, the margins are better, right? Like, oh, I can make more money on them because rates are more. So you have a better return. Well, does that mean that you're going to start adding all this additional invent, you know, this additional lending guidelines to the table, meaning no docs and lower credit score and all of those things. And, and look at where we are from a mortgage credit availability perspective. I mean, we're, we're lower than we were even in parts of 13, 14, 15. I mean, look at that. Like we're at, at a pretty stable, consistent place. So we're not having the, you know, so I don't think there's just going to be a rush to like, well, how, you know, how aggressive can we lend, number one? And then look at the credit score. Look at the credit scores under 620. Now, part of this is, is as a consumer, we become a lot more aware of where credit scores fall, but you also just can't get loans. Or if you do, the interest rates on them are significantly higher. Your mortgage insurance premiums are so high that it almost prices you out. But look at where we are. We're not like, look at quarter one of 2022. We're not just just all of a sudden going, well, let's start lending at 580 and let's start lending at 550 and like trying to increase because obviously from a mortgage perspective, if we're having less applications, that means less profit. And therefore, we're like, OK, well, how are we going to do that? Are we going to just just ride this out? Are we going to expand loan products so that we can increase the increase the, you know, the application count? And it just it's not happening. Right. We're sticking with you know, with the credit, you know, sort of box that we have, which is typically 620 or better. And, and, you know, in turn, you're not going to see a rush to the bottom in terms of like the, the lending guideline perspective, the 550s, the Nina's, the no docs, all that kind of stuff. So just a little bit different perspective to kind of add to the, like, this isn't, this isn't 08, this isn't 07. And, and a recession, as Todd mentioned, is not necessarily a bad thing. If anything, in the real estate side, it's actually Helps. creating some That's stability, right? right? It's yeah. it, you know, it's creating some um, some stable growth, which is which is probably needed. So that's what I got for the day. Uh, any questions? Oh, I did want to add one thing. You know, uh, the Bookspan Baker team and and Todd Bookspan are, are part of the the mortgage uh, modern mortgage real estate summit. And there is, um, uh, if you would like to go, you can Google it. But I have the code to offer you a, a chance to to kind of listen to some of these, uh, both real estate and mortgage lenders speak on uh, on the industry, on different tips and tricks. It's a really an amazing lineup. Um, so if you want, I can, um, if, you, if you email me or text me, I can send you the link. So um, I'll have my cell phone go into the chat so that you can do uh, do that. But it's the Modern Mortgage and Real Estate Summit starts Wednesday, but this code allows you like 30 day access to the content. Nice. That's what I got. I appreciate it. Appreciate it as always, uh, Matt. Great information. All right, moving right along to our three pack. Um, you know, I mean, for me, I'm I'm, I'm going to get into it. I, I and it seems maybe it's a little counterproductive to to what we've been hearing today, Todd. Why I'm really focusing on listings and some of the things that I'm doing to focus on listings. Obviously, uh, from what we're hearing today, uh, buyers are in a better position than they were two or three months ago. However, I think there is a, as we're seeing, there is a uptick in the amount of uh, properties that are going on the market. So I think it provides a great opportunity. So point number one on focusing on listings is really uh, focus on listings. Uh, understand this is where that you should shift your focus. Again, we are seeing an uptick in listings. So focus on getting some people are out there putting their house on the market uh, and I thought I think you, I, you know I'm, I think you would agree with me that we're expecting to see the number of available listings to continue to increase over the next couple months Correct. and we've always preached uh, listings are king this is where you want to be you want to get your hands on listings I, th I think the nature of listings and the nature of the timelines and what's going to happen to sell the property are are I think are just normalizing. That's really the term that I'm using. But I, I find that sellers are making more of an, a desperate attempt right now to cash in. 
Uh, and I don't anticipate uh, a market crash, but there is a perception that there is something impending, something looming that is coming uh, that's going to be uh, somewhat devastating to the market. So we're finding that sellers, I think, are, are on a mad dash to get their house on the market, Todd, and, and try to cash in before before something bad that they think is going to happen happens, which we're not anticipating, but there's some opportunity there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is really time, Mike, uh, to your point, uh, because there is a shift. Now, whether the shift is going to you know, continue to Mike's point, you know, it is still you know, a strategy to get your client approved. However, there's a little more inventory. There's fewer people competing. Mortgage rates are still, you know, although they're higher, they're, you know, I mean, I was just having a conversation with somebody the other day and, they're, and I, they said, uh, you know, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is so damaging to the industry and damaging to life and, you know, all of a sudden, I, and I sat back and I thought for a minute, I'm like, no, you know, 6%, uh, you know, is good. And if you can be under 6%, that's great. You know, sure. Okay. To, to, we've all missed markets right mike i mean we've all been involved in markets where if we had money or we or we'd seen some certain things hindsight's 2020 we we'd probably own 20 or 30 houses a piece now but the fact is we didn't and so you know this is that time uh to really pay attention so you know don't don't be the person who says no this is the way it is because it shifts every day um so mike to your particular point by focusing on listings what you're doing is you're taking the volatility out of your business you're saying hey if i go out there and i get a listing i've got 40 50,000 realtors that are out there trying to help me sell it but if i have a buyer you know, I've only had 7,000 properties to show. Well, now you've got 11,000. So even from that perspective, but I would say if you focus on listings, your business is going to grow this year. All right. Um, and I think, I mean, I'm using the terms, like I mentioned, I feel like the market, the market's just normalizing. I mean, you can call it a shift. It, it's just getting back to the way things used to be. Uh, rather than it it deteriorating or whether it's going downhill, you know what we've experienced over the last three years was just out of control and an anomaly. And and for me, it's just and, and that's the term that I'm using for my clients is the market is simply just becoming uh, normal. So understand this is where you should shift your focus. Point number two to focusing on listings, Nick, as we uh, move along is is one of the things that I'm doing. And that's what I promise. The things that I'm doing is I am really double downing on these neighborhood reports. Uh, I am not a, and I'm not judging anyone, um, I'm not a newsletter guy. Uh, and there's a lot of things that agents are using and that are sending to people that I'm just, I just don't focus on and I just don't do because at the end of the day, I'm wanting to provide people in my sphere of influence and the people that I'm connected with, with some of with the greatest things of value that I that I can come up with and the neighborhood reports I think are it it provides something of value it keeps them updated to what exactly is going on in their neighborhood uh, it lets them know when there's new listings it lets them know when there's new closings in their neighborhood and it's a fantastic uh, way to stay connected and you know you can use the MLS and you know I mean and and if people are, are aren't clear on what a neighborhood report is it's really the exact same thing as setting up a search uh, if you're helping a buyer but you're just setting it up for someone who bought a home from you or in a specific neighborhood and you're keeping them updated I'm a huge fan of our iPhone agent uh, websites and the premium versions of it uh, when I'm setting and I'm setting anybody and everybody up on these reports and the system lets me know when people are opening up the reports when people are visiting the websites when people are saving searches they and it lets me know who's interested in what's going on in their neighborhood and track activity and pick up the phone and have real estate conversations with these people todd you know, Mike, this is so important because this is exactly the problem or the re or the reason why NAR's annual report, the Home Buyer Home Seller Report, always shows that buyers, after having worked with a realtor, are always willing to use their realtor again, but down the road don't. To your point, it let me let me ask someone that's ask us all that's out there right now. Have you ever received anything a drip on a regular basis from any particular place that you know realistically it didn't matter? 
I mean, you know, it, you get stuff, but I mean, did it, was it really the caliber of information you wanted? Um, you know, was it, did it, did it really, uh, so in other words, if you want to control the, where the consumer goes and you have your own iPhone website and then you use this strategy Mike's in, uh, providing right now, what's going to happen is when those people go to check that, it takes them back to your personal site. doesn't take them back to Zillow. doesn't take them back to Armless. doesn't take them, it takes them and you can continue to, to receive reports on on what that activity is and then and then tweak it but to mike's point um you know I want to have a relationship with somebody where when I want the information, I can pick up the phone, have a conversation with somebody and not feel like I'm a stranger. So there's a delicate balance between me feeling comfortable and confident that I can pick up the phone and call Mike Weinstein and Mike's going to pick up the phone and provide me with the caliber of information that I'm looking for versus you send, you know what? I mean, I love recipes. I do all the cooking myself. I mean, I like the holidays. I love all these things. There's an element of warm and fuzzy that just is BS. And to be quite honest with you, get focused and and do things that you can hold accountable to getting you the results you're looking for. Hey, Nick, if I wanted to learn more about the iFound agent websites, where would I go? Yeah, right. You go to westusawebsite.com where you can sign up for React and uh, pop on over tomorrow and learn all about the iFound West websites. (laughs) All right. All right, and pick up the phone and call before they do. Your the, your people in your sphere of influence, your past clients, your present clients, anybody and everybody that owns a home are getting calls from iBuyers and investors. They are getting calls, and we you, you can't be silent. You've got to be part of that noise in their mouth. You got to be, or in their ears. You got to be a. You got to be a voice. Um, I'm dealing with a guy right now. Um, he's just, you know, I'm dealing with. He's got a call from, from an investor, and um, and I'm trying to show him that you're going to make more money, or you stand to make more money if you put your house on the open market as opposed to going with an investor. And this is the battle. So the people in your sphere of influence, your family members, they are getting calls. And you have to understand that. So you have to pick up the phone. You've got to start calling past and present clients. You've got to start and calling everybody in your sphere of influence, everybody in your database. But know the market, know your numbers, and know to handle objections. Know how, know what's on their minds and be able and be in a position to have deeper conversations with them. Because uh, those others, like I said, they're cash investors, Todd. They are still calling. Yes. They're calling calling they're calling and you've got to know when your client or somebody in your sphere of influence is getting a call from a cash investor what is tempting them because that is the objection that you have to overcome you know i used to say mike you know years ago when you and i were doing a lot of new home construction uh uh, investing meaning we were working with buyers that were interested in purchasing uh new homes as an investment um you know the the big thing really was it was control and and help and and so we, we would tell people listen if you get an offer from someone on your property and you think you're you even thinking that you might even consider taking it call me I can get you an estimated settlement sheet from my escrow officer um, that I have and and show you a, a really good approximation of what your net proceeds will be uh, because and then I can also bring them into in and in update them on what you and I all know about the iBuyer market that realistically they're somewhere between 15 to 27 percent behind today's market value uh, and and that happens because they and they 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 implement those strategies upon a an unsuspecting seller during the escrow period and so you know these are some of the uh, some of the things that, uh, that that we really need to know if we're when we're counseling people, but uh, pick up the phone and talk to people. There's nothing, there's nothing you can send them that builds a relationship or builds rapport as well as you on the other end of the telephone. Um, and, and you don't have to call them all the time. You must have a friend out there. I know you do. Somebody must have a friend. No, I know you've got a friend out there where when somebody calls you, it's, you pick up the phone, you haven't talked to them in a year and it's just like you talked yesterday, right? Well, that's a friend. And the question is how many of the people in your database do you have that kind of a relationship with? Uh, because that's what it takes to have your database refer business back to you. Go ahead, Mike. You know, I'm back to it. I, I, uh, I don't know about you, Todd. I get probably at least three calls a week for yeah. someone wanting to pay cash for my house. Or text. And I'm an agent. So if, if you are not picking up 
the phone, they, they're going to listen to somebody else. So, right. All right. So that is our three pack. Uh, great opportunities right now in today's market to really pick up some listings. But at the end of the day, nothing will substitute uh, picking up the phone and having real estate conversations with people. So that being said and done, we're going to bring in our own Mindy Thompson. Mindy, good morning. And what a lot of people don't realize about you is, I mean, obviously you are one of the key people that brings new agents to West USA. But one of the things that a lot of our agents don't realize about you is you are a coach on a national level and you coach top producing agents um, across the country. So uh, we had a conversation last week and I thought, you know, uh, I would like to hear like, you know, what are some of the five top things that you're seeing your coaching clients do uh, that are helping them be successful? So good morning and thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me back. And my talk is going to go very well with your three pack. So it's perfect. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I do coach for the Mike Ferry organization. I coach agents uh, throughout the United States and a couple in Canada, as well as some owners and brokers. And so, yes, um, as we all know, success leaves clues. It's not rocket science or something you have to get fancy about. Successful people are all kind of doing the same things. So why stray from that? So I'll just jump right in. Um, particularly right now, they are watching the market statistics on a weekly basis. Um, let's face it, the market has started to shift. And like you said, it's nothing, there's no chicken little, the sky's falling. It's just going back into something that's a little bit more healthy. And and that's good. But um Anyone that's been in this industry knows that the market shifts and, and it's just part of real estate and it will forever be part of real estate. And it just means that we have to make some small shifts. Um, you know, so why do we need to know? Why do we need to know the market stats? Well, first of all, if we're seeing days on market going up, we need to let our sellers know to expect this, right? We need, when we see increases in price reductions, like we have been the past few weeks on a national level, we need to go back to letting our sellers know that in a week or two, we may need to go back and take a look at reducing the price. So it helps us to be uh, professionals and perform at the highest level possible. It's also going to help you um, when you are pricing properties. Again, when you're educating your buyers and sellers, uh, remember, they rely on us to be the expert, okay? Um, and then it helps us with setting appropriate expectations um, with, with our buyers and our sellers. Now, it's your job as a realtor to always be on top of what's happening in the market, okay? In real time, last month was last month, okay? What happened six months ago? is no longer relevant um, to what we are seeing anymore. Um, if, if I were to ask you if you were to get stopped in a grocery store and someone's asking you if, they're, if what they're hearing on the news is true, how well equipped are you to share that information with somebody? Um, the media, shocker, is sensationalizing. Well, I, I, don't even, I, don't even have to, I don't even have to know the question. The answer is always no. If you're hearing it on the news, the answer to that question is, yeah. always know it is not true <laughs> right yeah the media is just they just love this topic right now and they're blowing it way out of proportion but it's up to us to sort of be that calming force and you know to consumers and to be able to present them with facts and not speculation and so if you're on this webinar good for you because you get this by the week and, and right now if you're a realtor, you do need to be watching the stats by the week because they are changing that quickly. Um, and so, yes, so you're, you're always watching your market stats and you know what they mean. You're not just watching them, but you actually know what those things mean and then the indicators to look for moving forward. Yeah, so Todd, the difference, um, I mean, the agent, okay, yeah, and, and, and Mindy, I'm glad you threw that in the last, you know, the last second there, because there's one thing of watching the market statistics, but can you interpret those market statistics? Can you use that information to, to overcome? 
But especially, Todd, in this marketplace, there are agents that just aren't following the stats and aren't able to have a educated discussion with a buyer or seller. And regardless of whether the news is good or whether the news is bad, you know, if I'm going in to see my doctor because I've got something wrong with me, um, an educated answer and an ex and and an, and an explanation and having an expert opinion really goes a long way with me. And that part for me is half the battle for so many agents today. Yeah, I, I think the biggest uh, the the problem with being a source of anything is that you are then the person or where the eyeballs fall when they find out that the information is not accurate. Uh, that you shared with them. So it's always important. I mean, you can throw me under the bus anytime you want uh, with any of your clients. And if you want, if they give you a question that you're not capable of answering, text me and I'll, and I'll give you that answer. Uh, but again, the most important thing is that when you do open your mouth, um, you're intelligent. Uh, what you're saying is true and accurate to the market here in Phoenix, the hyper local, you know, 10,000 foot view versus the 60,000 foot view. Um, and, and just to your point, um, you know, make, stay, stay abreast. That's why we do this, Mike. That's why you and I offer these, the, the webinars every Monday is really just to, you know, uh, to, to help people understand that. And if you don't know how to really read all the stats yourself, if you go back to our Westwards uh, articles, um, every January last couple of years, I have posted, um, how to read the market stats in a two-part segment, uh, so January, February usually, and it breaks down every single statistic that we're talking about and how we come up with it and why it's important to the marketplace. You might want to refresh yourself and take a look back. All right, great. All right, let's go to point number two, Mindy. They talk to people every work day, okay? <laughs> so I've said it before, and I'm just going to remind you again, every day that you go without talking to people, is a day that you have a closed sign on your business, okay? So if you boil down our job all the way down to the bottom, it's just talking to people, okay? And so some realtors, they prefer to focus and talk to past clients and friends. Great, perfect. Some like to talk to groups of people who have already put their hand in the air and said, I want to sell my home. Who are they? They're expired listings. They're for sale by owners. Okay, they're not cold calls. They're calls to people who have outwardly expressed interest in selling. Those two sources, expired listing and for sale by owner, they will always convert at the highest rate, okay? Because it's much different than opening your phone book and dialing down a bunch of numbers and hoping someone wants to sell. You can call those two groups people who've already said they wanted to. So um, you can... Talk to people around your current listings, okay? There is a phenomenon in real estate you might not know about. Usually when a home goes up for sale, one or two around it go up shortly thereafter, okay? It's a mini pet peeve of mine to drive down a block where there are four sale signs, like three or four different brokerages, because here's what that means to me. If Mike took a listing on that block and he spent an hour door knocking the neighbors around and introducing himself, mm -hmm. Mike could have three signs on that block. Yep. And the, the other thing about door knocking, and it gets a bad rap and I, and I know it does, but I want you to know that it still does work. Mm -hmm. And fun fact, um, knocking on doors virtually eliminates your competition. Your competition will refuse to do it. Um, so it puts you in a completely different class. If you're a newer agent, if you're struggling with maybe people who are more experienced than you, this is still something that you can do that actually still does work. Uh, excuse me. Um, talking to your past clients, friends, and family on a consistent basis about real estate will also yield you pretty high results. Those calls convert at the third highest rate after expired in FISBO, okay? Um, raise your hand if you've ever run into a past client or even a relative who's listed their home with someone else. Ouch. Okay. Pain never goes away. You never forget it. <laughs> That's it, you're right. Okay, guys. People have lives, okay? They lose your card. Uh, they get a job, a job transfer, and then they rush to sell the home out of convenience to the eye buyer because they think it's just the cleanest way to do it, okay? That's our fault. 
Okay. Um, the real reason they do it is because you just weren't in touch with them enough. All right. So if you want a rule of thumb, call or text every past past client once a quarter. Okay. So once every three months, and that'll be a pretty good rule of thumb. Um, it'll keep you current enough in their mind. So when they do need to buy or sell, and if they come across someone who needs to buy or sell, it'll keep you relevant enough in their mind where they go, Oh, you've got to use Todd. He's amazing. Okay. Um, Another group of people that they, my successful clients call is their leads. Okay. <laughs> Seems like common sense, but I got to tell you, I've been around long enough to know better. Um, anyone who I coach knows I'm going to ask them every single week when the last time they called their leads was. And in the hint, uh, you can't call them too much. You can call them too little though. Okay. And I have had a client in the past who's lead actually listed with somebody else. And she asked them why. And they go, well, I hadn't heard from you. I thought you were too busy. I didn't want to bother you. That's it right there. They think you're busy. Yeah. Too busy. Ouch. You know, and, and this is a $15,000 mistake. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pick up the phone mm -hmm. like Mike and Todd were talking about a couple minutes ago and call people. I'm, I'm going to just interject one thing, Mike, uh, and, and that is uh, on the topic of the word expired. Um, so there's a thing going around the industry right now that I've got to just quickly let everybody know. And what it is, is you are not allowed to call another broker's expired listings unless you have washed their phone number through the do not call list. Uh, it's very, very, very important. Uh, fines are running anywhere from they start off at about 2,500 bucks and quickly escalate uh, up to as high as 15 or $20,000 per phone call that you've made. So, you know, the thing is, is that you do have to wash those through, but you, to, to Mindy's other point, you can go up and knock on a door and have a conversation anytime you want. There's absolutely no, and you know what? You're probably the only realtor who physically knocked on the door. So if you want to eliminate all those voicemails that people are getting, which are honestly against the law, you know, that uh, many times if the per per person is on the DNC, uh, you get to go and be the shining star because you did one thing they all didn't do. You showed up. Absolutely. And it, it, I find that most of the time when people hesitate to call expired past clients, friends and family leads, um, it's typically because they don't know what to say. Um, so if you want to work on the what to say, call us. That's what we do for a living. Okay. <laughs> we will help you. Um, and so that's all I have on that point, Mike. Um, all right. I would also just say um, you got plenty to say. Uh, I call people and just say, Hey, I know that everybody's seeing a shift in the market. Everybody's seeing stuff on the news. What questions do you have about the real estate market that I can answer for you? And uh, they always talk. And, and we and we also say on our team, Ryan's got a great line. Uh, there's no such thing as a cold call. Everything's a hot call. If you pick up your phone today and say, I'm making cold calls today, you have already lost the battle. <laughs> They're right. always hot calls. All right, let's go to point number three. They watch their personal numbers. So uh, they watch the market stats, okay? But they also watch their own numbers. So it, you guys, I'll, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a fun game to play. Walk through the office, and when you see a realtor, say, how many homes have you sold year to date? How many of those were buyers versus sellers? How much money have you made so far this year? What are your business expenses? Bet you nine out of 10 of them can't give you those numbers off the top of their head. And, and that's a big mistake, okay? Watch this. Um, how many homes will you sell this year? Who could answer that with like any amount of conviction who really does not know their numbers, mm -hmm. okay? Um, anyone I coach knows how many homes are gonna sell this year. And, and they'll hit it within probably five to 10 uh, by the end of the year, okay? but. The reason that they know that is because they're intentional and deliberate about their numbers and their tracking of what they do. Okay. So that they can forecast that. Um, they also have a business plan that is going to use, they're going to use as a map to get to that number. Okay. So do you have a business plan? All right. How often are you looking at it? If you do have one, you should be looking at it at least once a week. Um, 
If you do not have one, that's okay. It's not too late. It's never too late in the year to write one. And uh, it doesn't cost anything. So a West USA coach, if you'd like, will sit down with you and go, hey, what do you need to do this year? Well, let's get a plan in place to help you get there. And there's no fee for that. OK, so if you don't have one and you're not sure what your numbers are or watch this, if you don't have a goal for this year, please call us right away because we'll help you with that. OK, if you don't have systems would, in place this year to hit your yeah. goals, please call us. Yeah. And the, the other thing I would just uh, comment on this is, you know, one of the biggest components of a business plan is the action plan behind it. What are the things? And and going back to our previous conversation, Mindy, um, you can't substitute real estate conversations. You can't substitute picking up the phone and calling people. This is a relationship based business. If you want if you put together your business plan, you have set your goals, you've got to understand that that means you've got to have X amount of real estate conversations. And, and I always teach our team, when I take a look at my pipeline, my pipeline's always a direct reflection of my phone activity or the number of real estate conversations that I'm having. And I know when I look at my pipeline, I'm like, oh boy, my wife's gonna be really upset. I can look back and say, I haven't been working the phones or I haven't been out having real estate conversations. Or conversely, if my pipeline is looking pretty strong at any given moment, I know that my phone activity and my real estate conversation activity is is on point. But so I just wanted to say that about watching the personal numbers. Got to be having real estate conversations. And for the sake of time, I want to jump into point number four, Nick. Oh, okay, time wise. Go. They're held accountable. And um, I know that this is the point of my five that everyone will hate the most, but it doesn't <laughs> matter because it's it's the truth. Um, being held accountable to your goals um, isn't always the most fun part of our week, but look around at anyone successful at what they do. They have probably been coached at some point, or they are still the really successful ones. They're probably still coached and mentored. Okay. So why are you different? <laughs> What's different about you? Okay. We all know how to work out yet we'll hire a fitness trainer. Okay. We know how to eat healthy yet. We hire diet coaches. We know how to sell, but who's checking in on us to be sure we're doing what we're supposed to do on a daily basis, okay? Making those calls, getting out of your comfort zone and knocking an expired, okay? Calling your leads. The reason anyone hires a coach or practices accountability is because it works, okay? Um, we're more likely to hit the gym if a trainer is waiting there for us. Um, accountability puts skin in the game. And it's a fact. When we have skin in the game, we are going to be more likely to perform at our best. So who's checking in on you? Who are you accountable to? It can't be yourself, okay? Um, like Mike said, one of your best accountability partners is your spouse mm -hmm. because they will be brutally honest <laughs> with you. Yeah. yeah you know, I'll, I'll just yeah. jump in and say, you know, Mike, that uh, we've talked about this before a uh, great way that the biggest problem with the industry and why there's an 80, 20 rule or nine 85, 15, whatever you want to call it uh, is because there are many of us that are, S's and C's in a disc assessment. So, you know, if you haven't done yet the West USA, gone to West USA disc with a DISC dot com, I urge you to do it because being, you know, you have to know who you are and then you have to have that action plan, Mike, that you talked about that actually brings you closer to those goals that you've set for yourself. But if you don't know who you are, um, you know, this industry, the reason the 80, 20 exists is because 80% of, of realtors are S's and C's, which are retail salespeople. That environment for them is where the consumer comes to them. Uh, open houses or other types of uh, events like that. The S the I's and the D's are field salespeople. They're the people that just wake up every morning and either because they know if they talk to hundred people, they're going to close 1.5 or, or they're going to talk to hundred people just they love people, one of the two. Uh, but again, you have to know yourself and you have to be willing to be accountable. And that takes us into the next com uh, the next section. Well, and I would also, I, I would I'd like to maybe expound upon a little bit more. Um, I mean, really who we are, you can, you can talk about this all you want, who we are are people. 
and as people, uh, we tend to take the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And that means, and when we don't have accountability, that means the path of least resistance is, you know, I don't have to do what I'm going, what I'm supposed to be doing. And so, uh, you know, I'd like to bring Nick in the conversation. I mean, we've got some great platforms here at West USA, whether it's the coaching program or teams or finding another accountability partner. I mean, it, it's critical, but it's up to each one of us to, to figure out who's going to hold us accountable. But there are platforms that are our options, Nick, here at West USA. Yeah, I mean, I mean, everyone's talked about it this morning. There's a lot of different avenues for getting into coaching, having someone hold you accountable. It doesn't have to be in an official capacity like Mindy mentioned. It can be a friend, a spouse, a loved one. But the teams and the coach program that we have at West USA – are there to help. Uh, we have seen a lot of agents who can fast forward their careers by talking to a coach one time, um, getting on a team and joining that culture program. Uh, and as we also have our inbound sales, there's a lot of multitude of things that you can do. If you're not sure where to start, just have a conversation with your branch manager, with another agent in one of the offices, uh, and they can try to point you in the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah. And also say, um, start with Mindy. We've got her email and phone number up here and uh, she definitely can point you in the right direction. Very, very fluent in our teams here at West USA and our coaching department and definitely can, uh, can give you some tips. All right, let's jump into the last one. They are continuous, continuously working on developing their skills. Um, you never arrive, okay? So you might look around and you see these really fancy schmancy real estate agents and you go, man, they've arrived. Well, they haven't. Um, chances are, progress. yeah, chances are they are still sharpening their skills all the time. So you're never going to know it all. And then even when you think you do know it all, the market's going to shift and you're back <laughs> learning again. Okay. So just accept the fact that you're, you're going to be a work in progress. I want to give kudos for anyone listening here because you are the type of person who wants to continue to grow, okay? You listen to webinars, you listen to podcasts, you stay educated on the market stats on a weekly basis. So good for you, okay? If I were to ask you to walk into a listing appointment with a seller that you do not know and you know you're going to be competing against three other agents, how confident are you? How confident are you walking in? And then how confident are you when you walk out? And if the answer is, I'm not sure, well, then you got some practicing to do and that's okay, right? When's the last time someone listened to your presentation mm -hmm. and gave you feedback? Like, look, you've got Todd Menard here. You've got Mike Weinstein. You've got some of the most successful real estate agents who can sit down with you for no charge and go, hey, let me tell you where you could tweak that, you know, and, and get a little bit better. Feedback isn't always pleasant, but it will always make you better. Okay. Okay. I want to jump in. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I, you know, because we're running out of time. So I want to, and, and I'll let Todd, Nick, anyone jump in. I mean, we can say, uh, what are some of the skill levels or the skills right now that we should be focusing on? You know, when we're taking a look at the market shifts, you're taking a look at, um, you know, the agents that you're coaching around around the country, um, what are some of those skills that people are really trying to hone in on right now? Presentation skills, always, always buyer presentation, seller presentation, always uh, pricing skills, always going to be one of the most highly skilled things that we do in this industry. Um, Talking to people and handling objections. So when Todd goes, hey, I'm really afraid to sell my house right now, Mindy. Um, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to find a property to buy. Well, what? Are, look, we get the same things over and over and over. Right. May as well learn a really good answer to those things. Okay. Um, and so yeah, so that's what that's what I would I would I would say practice. Practice your skills. And if you're not sure, if you're going into a listing presentation, sit down and practice it out loud two or three times before you go in. Actors do it. Uh, baseball players do it. That's what practice, right? Repetitions and all that. Why do we think we're different? We're not. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's what I do. And I'd ask for feedback. I'd search for it um, because it's going to make you better every time. Yeah, I, do, I would just say that uh, remember – that you'll never have every answer to every question. And so you've got to be good at, uh, at 
I would say, you know, the first thing in building a listing presentation is building questions, Mike. You've, you've, we've talked about this for years about asking open-ended questions. Um, and, you know, if you ask enough questions, the seller will tell you their objection. If you fail, then all you're going to do is spew upon them thinking you're the greatest thing since ice cream. And the reality is you're not going to get the listing. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to always go back to my catch all, which is systems. Uh, Mike Ferry told the story when he was on with webinar a year ago that he, he went to market for someone to list his home and the person that he gave the listing to, it wasn't the best listing presentation. It was the person that followed up right after the listing presentation. And if you don't have systems in place to automate a, a little bit of your business, you don't have time to reach back out to these people That's and have these conversations. So yeah. I'm always going to just keep ringing that systems bell. Yep. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point. I interviewed uh, last week an agent from uh, the central Washington area who did over 200 personal transactions last year. And I always ask the question, if you could go back in time and tell yourself one thing as you get started again, and she goes, I wouldn't talk to one person without having my systems in place. So it's good stuff. Mindy, appreciate you as always. Great, great information. Thanks, Todd. And uh, we we'll move right along uh, for our quote of the day. What you do speak so loudly that I cannot hear what you say. I like uh, appreciate everybody joining us today and go out and sell a home. <laughs>